Hola, everyone. That should be no surprise by now. This is Jared Taylor from the Biology 112 teaching team here at UBC. In the last video, I introduced the four major macromolecules that we care about in biochemistry and biology, three of which we cover here in Biology 112. In this video, I would like to talk about the first of the macromolecules that you will see in class, lipids, and by extension, cell membranes. So let's change things up a bit and ask a slightly different type of question to start this off. How? How do cells hold on to their stuff? It might seem like a silly question, but the answer is quite fundamental to cell biology. You see, one of the things that makes a cell a cell is that it has a container that keeps all of its important stuff together in one place. This container, which is essentially a sealed flexible bag, is what defines the cell's boundary. It is the border that defines the tiny bit of the universe that belongs to the cell. This container serves as a perimeter fence, a barrier to the environment, a wall to hold stuff in, and a gateway for things that need to move in and out. This amazing structure is what we call the cell membrane. But enough waxing poetic, let's move on. The primary subunit of a cell membrane is a type of lipid that we call a phospholipid. The general structure is shown here, and it comprises two important regions. The first is a head region that contains a number of polar bonds, and often ionic charges. For this reason, we refer to the head region as the polar head. Attached to the head are two tails that consist entirely of carbon and hydrogen bonds. This makes the tails completely nonpolar, and thus we refer to them as the nonpolar tails. So, as you can see, Phospholipids contain both polar and nonpolar regions. Such molecules are referred to as being amphipathic. For simplicity, I will show the phospholipids like this for the remainder of the video. One of the remarkable things about phospholipids is that when added to water, they spontaneously form bilayers, with the polar heads facing the aqueous solution and the tails sandwiched in the middle. This creates a very hydrophobic core within the bilayer. Why the phospholipids spontaneously arrange themselves into a bilayer structure is something we discussed during class. For now, let me mention the type of noncovalent interactions involved. The polar heads interact with each other and the surrounding water using a variety of permanent dipole and ion-based interactions. On the other hand, the tails interact with each other using induced dipole to induced dipole interactions. The phospholipid bilayer is the primary base structure of a cell membrane. And to pretty it up a bit, let me add some depth to the layer shown here since it does extend in two dimensions. Now, a phospholipid bilayer by itself is quite fragile and not stable enough to be a cell membrane on its own. Cells solve this issue by integrating other components into the membrane that make it more robust and rigid. Proteins and sterols are a good example of this. One important aspect of the cell membrane is that it is largely held together by non-covalent interactions. The phospholipids and other membrane components are not usually covalently linked. This results in the different components being free to move laterally past each other. This concept is known as the fluid mosaic model of cell membranes. In essence, the cell membrane acts as a two-dimensional fluid where components can more or less freely move past each other. To show you what I mean, Let's look straight down on a patch of cell membrane. Again, we have some proteins and sterols embedded in the membrane. Since these are not covalently attached to each other, they can float around in the plane of the membrane. Even the phospholipids can easily move around freely. There are some restrictions in certain areas of cell membranes, but these are things you will learn about in future courses. One of the big functions of the cell membrane is to act as a barrier and a gate to certain molecules. Some molecules can pass through freely, while others cannot. We will discuss the trends in class, but I will mention a few here. First of all, small nonpolar molecules can easily pass between the phospholipids and enter or exit the cell. Carbon dioxide and oxygen are good examples of this. Water, while polar, can also pass through the membrane fairly easily. The direction of net movement depends on concentration gradients, which we will discuss in class. In the case of water, the net direction of movement depends upon osmotic pressure, which is something you will have learned about in high school. 
As molecules get bigger and more polar, they are generally unable to pass through the cell membrane and are usually blocked, as is the case for the glucose molecules shown here. Another trend that is very important is that ions, such as sodium ions and protons, are unable to pass through the cell membrane at all and are completely blocked. This is a property that is extremely important and is exploited by cells for functions such as signaling, energy production, and transport. Which brings us to one final point. If cell membranes are barriers to molecules, what happens to molecules that the cell wants to get in or out but that cannot cross the membrane by themselves? Well, when cells want to do something, the answer is almost always proteins, which is true here. A large class of proteins known as transporters is responsible for moving molecules in and out of the cell as needed. For example, glucose is an important food molecule for cells. To get glucose molecules across the cell membrane, a transport protein is employed. One such transporter uses a sodium gradient to move glucose molecules into the cell, as shown here. A glucose molecule and some sodium ions are moved together from the outside of the cell to the inside. You will see various types of transport proteins during your time here in Biology 112, along with some examples. Okay, well, I feel like I have droned on long enough, so let me tie this video off. Hopefully this has given you some insight on the cell membrane and how it is useful as both a container and a barrier for cells. In class, we will discuss lipids and cell membranes in much more detail, as well as discussing the mechanisms of cell transport more thoroughly.